uh, in his life, man. So welcome Dave, Gabe up here, man. <laughs> Gabe. <laughs> he gets a stool. What's up, guys? Man, am I nervous? <laughs> I, uh, I have an iPad with all my notes. I don't hear audibly from the Lord like Pastor Phil does. So uh, I brought this, so don't, don't hate on me for it. So, um, you know, we just finished Genesis, and uh, my Devo's back in Genesis. And so um, I'm calling it... Uh, faith versus comfort, because uh, recently I've come across a situation in my life where I've gone through some things, and so it made me just start um, thinking, like, what are your steps of faith? Um, have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought about what steps you're taking actively in your life in faith? I mean, faith is ultimately what pleases God, and the fact that we believe in Jesus is the biggest step of faith we can take. But so often, after we take that initial first step, we can become comfort or, or just complacent. And so I just had a big decision to make for myself and my family. And um, so with that, I'll get into it. And, um, but we're going to go to uh, First Genesis 12, 1 through 4. The call of Abram. The Lord has said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with content. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Um, so that came to my mind because... Um, well, let me just get back to when it started. Um, a little while ago, my father-in-law asked us to start praying about moving to Vegas because they're retiring there. Um, and they wanted us to move there and be there with them and our family. And we didn't want to do that. My wife and I were like, no, that's not really something we want. I don't like Vegas. I hate the heat. It's, I don't like sweating. And so why am I going to move to Vegas? Um, so that was where we are, but we'll pray for it. We'll see what happens. And, and we did. We prayed that night, and um, we left it there. And so, and not really expecting God to answer that prayer, we just went forward in life. And then all of a sudden I got a, a call from work that's saying, hey, we're making cuts. You're going to be part of group A or group B. And uh, you'll be on a conference call, and it'll let you know if you're going to keep your job. So we're like, oh, that's great. We'll just see where that lands. And I ended up keeping my job, which was a great thing, but it opened up all these positions in my company because they restructured everyone based upon location and where they were living. And the one place that was open was Paradise, Nevada, and um, that became an option all of a sudden. So, you know, I, it crossed my mind. I was like, whoa, that's actually something that could happen. And so I brought it to my wife, and we talked about it, and I'm like, whoa, that's... That, that can actually happen. Like, we didn't think it was even an option because I had talked to the manager a long time ago about it, and he was like, yeah, I'll let you know, but things don't pop up that often. And so I talked to my boss about it. I said, hey, what is, what is that like? What, what would that look like if I were to take that step? And he said, well, you got to do it now because they're moving people all over to fill these positions, so it's something that's got to be done quick. And so, you know, talking about the wife, we're like, what are we going to do? So I called Phil. And he told me, gave me great advice, but he said, all of me, it's, it's going to come down to, you know, fasting. Sometimes you got to do that. And so we did. So me and my wife said, okay, that's, that's great advice. We, ne we don't do that very often. I can't remember the last time we did it, but let's fast. And so I was like, well, my mom's in town. We're going to be doing all these things. I was like, let's just wait till Monday. And my wife, like the Holy Spirit, was like, No you're going to put God first and you're going to fast him even when it's not convenient because this decision is inconvenient. I was like, man, that hits me hard. I was like, all right. So we fasted on Saturday and, you know, I was just waiting for the Lord to hear. And, and I was like midday went by and I was like, did you hear anything from the Lord? She's like, no, nothing. And I was like, me neither. But we talked about it. And as we started just talking in that conversation of asking if we heard anything, it came that 
um, this whole move, it's either going to be a step of faith or we're going to stay in comfort. And that was kind of the theme that the Lord put on our, my heart and her heart when I talked about it, that moving to Vegas would be more of a step of faith. And we, we, act, we outlined practical reasons like, oh, we can buy a house. It's cheaper. But, you know, we were trying to sell ourselves on the idea. And so, you know, we, we came to the idea, okay, well, we'll talk about it with friends and see what we did. And we talked with friends and family, and, and they kind of gave us an option. Hey, why don't you at least look around? You can probably find places here that you can find. And so we, we did, and we looked around, but it just didn't sit right with us. It, it didn't feel right looking, and we weren't really seeing anything anyways, and it came down to, I, I just think it's, it's still that step of faith we can take, or we can be comfort where we're at. And so, um, so we decided to draw our line in the sand. And so we said, you know what, we'll take that step of faith and, and do it. And so it was literally like in two days that we made this decision. And so we, we took that step, and it's, it's funny because um, once we did it, all of a sudden we started getting a little encouragements from the Lord where we didn't really see, we saw, they told us, you're not going to get any help. You know, you're just going to have to move there on your own. All of a sudden they're giving me a relocation fee our relocation expense, and you're getting a lot of encouragement from people, but I found myself selling people on why we were going there when I would tell them. i tell my family, oh, we're going there because we can buy a house, we can do this, it's going to be better for our family, and, I, and as we, we stepped in faith, I started selling people on the practical things, and then I started realizing, like, why am I trying to sell it to these people? And it's because a lot of times they're not believers, or they don't think, like, that you would make a decision based on faith. But I had to come back to that. And so the more I rested on it and thought about it, I was like, no, we're not going there for practical reasons. We're going there because we feel God has placed it on our hearts. And it has to be that step of faith. We don't want to leave here. We don't want to come out of this community that we've been in for our for a better part of my life and my wife's whole life. But it was a step of faith. And so, um, so we did that. And after... We drew the line, we talked, I had a mental breakdown. <laughs> like, I had to, I was like, after I said yes to the decision, it was like, all of a sudden fear just flooded in. And I was hit, and I was attacked, and um, you know, I think a lot of times when I think of Abraham, and he had to leave that, his home. You know, when he was in Hadar, he had everything he needed. His dad left him a business, he had friends, he had community, and that's why I, I speak to this story because the week before I was reading it in a, a homeschool book that I read with my son. It's called Story of the World. And I was reading about Abraham and his old background and, and how when God called him, it wasn't practical. It didn't make sense, but he was given a promise and he was stepping out on faith. And, and he had to make that move. He had to leave what was comfortable to do what God had called him to do. And I don't know what God's calling me to do in Vegas, to be honest. I have no idea and I'm not comparing myself exactly to Abram, but I'm just saying I could see his situation, and it, it resonates with me. And so, so as I'm going through this, I'm just thinking to anyone, what are your steps of faith? What, is, what, is, what are you comfortable in, and what are you willing to take, take steps of faith? Because ultimately, we got to know the Lord is with us wherever we go. Joshua 1, 9, he will be with us wherever we go. So... It's not like he's not going to be with you if you make the wrong mistake, but he's going to be with you. The bigger blessing will be if you take the step of faith. The greater reward will be if you trust in him and give him the room to move. So my encouragement is to just invite you guys to take that look in your life and see what those steps could be. And not, not getting comfortable, not getting complacent, and, and moving in faith to the Lord. Letting him work, giving him room to work. And so that's my encouragement. Um, I'm leaving March 27th, but honestly, you guys have been a huge blessing in this room. I've uh, I've become grown. I've grown to become of a man, I'm not a full man. I'm still on that path, but I mean, when I started here eight years ago, I just had my son, and so a lot of changes has happened in this room. And so I'm grateful for this ministry, for all you guys, and um, I just want to share that and hope it's an encouragement to you.
What's up, guys? So Gabe's going to Vegas, man. He's going to, I told him he's going to go try to hit, hit the big one. You know, but that's cool, man. He's hearing from the Lord and taking that step of faith. That never ends for any of us, I don't think, man. That's what God calls us to do, taking steps of faith continually. That's what this walk is about. That's the hardest part. That's the part I hate the most, taking steps of faith, trusting. so hard to do, uh, unfortunately. Isn't that weird, though? We believe God is holding the universe in, in the palm of his hand, but it's so hard to trust him. <laughs> Ugh, it's the flesh. So um, let's pray, man. Let's get into the book of Exodus and finish up the chapter where we left off. Um, the Lord has a word for us tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word that Gabe just shared with us, Lord, and the things that you're doing in his life, Lord, how you, how you continue to move us and you call us out, Lord, uh, to faith and that we trust in you. And that is hard, Lord, but ultimately we realize at the end of the day that it's good to trust in you because you love us. You care for us, Lord. You have a plan for us. And so, Lord, we just pray that your word as it goes forth, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, Lord, give us ears to hear, past our flesh and our minds and our tiredness and whatever's going on, that your word would get right to our souls, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so <clears throat> we started the book of Exodus, chapter one, all right? We got into looking at that whole uh, transition between the children of Israel coming in as, as 70 people. Now they're at millions I talked. To, I kind of gave some Bible study about, you know, the timeline of how all this went down and where we're at here. And that, that timeline to me is fascinating because the timeline really describes and spells out God's work, God's plan, God's long suffering, God's uh, how He uses time. And so now uh, we're seeing the children of Israel. They've turned. Well, actually, let me let me take that back. Who've turned into the children of Israel now? From 70 to millions, They're, they become a nation. And I think for the most part, uh, when, you, when you think of, all right, cool, God finally made them a nation. This is good. You would think that then God would begin his, his plan for the nation. Now he's got them as a massive group of people. So let's see what he's going to do with them now. And instead, we see them now falling into a place of suffering <laughs> and bondage. And that's so bizarre sometimes when you think that way. So we talked about last week how God uses, and I keep referring to Egypt here as the furnace, how he uses the furnace in order to continue to, to build the nation, how he uses trials and struggles to continue to build and grow the believer. And so now, j just like anything, though, and this is what's interesting about where we're going to pick up here tonight, is here's the Lord using now the situation uh, the, the suffering, the bondage, the, the trial, and, and look at how now we're going to see the enemy continue to come in, continue to try, and now take it a step further. Because, you know, one thing that happens with all of us when we begin to experience trials or challenges is the next part uh, that we have to kind of deal with is the voice of Satan. Uh, and the tactics of the enemy. He too likes to jump in the game when God is doing something in our lives. The enemy too likes to come in and start messing with us and getting involved in that. And so we see them here multiplying, and the enemy doesn't want that to happen. See, Satan doesn't want the believer to grow, period. He doesn't want you to draw closer to the Lord. He doesn't want both of us, he doesn't want you and I to get further into the word, to become a Christian that's seeing more fruit. You know, if you're starting to see fruit in your life, if you're beginning to be a believer who now is ministering to people or you're finding that you're being effective for the work of God, that's the, that's the worst thing to Satan is a believer now who is being used by God. And so what is he going to do? Well, he's going to try to stop it in any way that he can. He's going to try to stop it and put an end to it right away. It's like the thief comes to kill. Right? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's what he wants to do with you and I. Constantly. Isn't that kind of messed up? Constantly. 
constantly thinking this way, planning this way, making moves in our lives this way. And so we're going to start off here tonight by now looking at the, the bondage that the children of Israel are going to be undergoing. But now look what happens, as if, it, as if it's going it's, it's to get better, you know. It's starting off at verse 15. Let's check it out. Let's read it together. Um, so verse 15 says, now, after, and this is after he put them all to, to service of rigor and all. Now the king of Egypt, he spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Sipra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So here's the king thinking, all right, I got an idea to stop the growth of this nation, to stop them from growing. I'm going to kill them <laughs> straight up. Let's just get right to the point. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to use uh, an internal practice that they do, this midwife thing that they do, this cultural thing that they do, this thing that, that's uh, something a part of their, their lives. This is an intricate part of their lives. And not only is it an intricate part of their lives, it's a part of the most, the most special part of their life in their culture, and that is childbirth. Obviously, the children of Israel have gotten into the groove of having babies here. They're forking them out by the thousands, okay? And that's what we, we see about the, the growth of the nation. And so they had to put this practice in place on how they deliver their children. And they used midwives to do it. It's part of the whole back-in-the-day doctor kind of thing. And it, notice that there's a word here where it says, when you, sit, when you see them upon the stools. Now, that's interesting. Because what, what, peop, what the translators are saying is that more than likely what the king of Egypt was saying is when you see the wife about to have the baby, you put them on this, this stool. And that could either mean by their bedside or that could mean by a riverbed. And so the commentators kind of were saying this might have been a suggestion where he's saying this is how I want you to do it. I basically want you to just take the baby out, throw it in the river, and get rid of him if it's a, a son. So... Interesting how tactic one here, well, let me say tactic number two here, as far as if I can't get them through the bondage, let me see about killing their babies. It's not something new to the scripture, by the way, or new to, to ancient kings in the past either. If I could kill them at the, the time of their birth, then we can stop the population. If we can wipe the baby out, we can stop the population. It reminded me of what's known as the the Massacre of Innocents. How many of you guys are familiar with that? It's in the New Testament over in Matthew chapter 2. And this is why this came to my mind because I thought, you know, the enemy still works the same way here even in the New Testament where we see in the time of Jesus being born, we know that, we, we see that um, when he, it says here in verse 13, and when they were departed, this is Matthew chapter 2 verse 13, when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take your young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. Basically, coming to Joseph and saying, You got to go. Why? Because Herod, the king at this time, got wind, that I'm going to paraphrase, that there's a king to be born. And so basically what he said is, I want all the boys killed from two and under. And this is what we know as the, the massacre of, of the innocents. And so... You see, the enemy uses this tactic every time there's a threat, every time there's growth to God's people. And of course, in the New Testament here, this was even more so because it would be the Savior being born, the King being born. And so he tries the same thing. And as I was thinking and getting, and getting the study ready, I thought, you know, it's interesting today how we, we do see till, still till this day the massacre of innocence. And it's just kind of overlooked. It's happening in our cities all, all day long, actually. As a matter of fact, babies are being killed all the time. And now the enemy has worked so many years to work this out that he's got the, the wife or the, the, the mom making the decision to do it. Not just, not just the outside uh, influence. Like in these cases, we had the kings doing it. But nowadays, people are, you know, they have their right to do it. And so they're making the same decision to stop, to to take out innocent life. And so, this is a no good thing happening. 
And now these midwives are put in a real gnarly situation. Because now these women, and now we don't know if these two women that are mentioned are like the, the, you know, the trainers of the midwives or something. Why he picked these two? Because they were more than likely influential to the rest of the midwives throughout the children of uh, Israel. And so he's thinking by getting to these two, he's going to be able to influence the decisions they all make. Very kind of interesting tactic, but horrible and morbid all at the same time. Being just real careless about the destruction of life. So these two women are in a situation. And now let's see what verse uh, 17 goes on to say. But the midwives, what does it say? They feared God. And they did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? What are you doing? I told you what to do. It's interesting to me. There's a verse in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. I love this scripture. It says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. See, these women, there was something about their hearts that, that checked them in this. They feared God. This is, a, this is going to be kind of my point of the study tonight. They feared the Lord. So because they feared the Lord, they were able to not do what the king commanded them to do. They said, no, we're, what? we're not taking life. We're not going to do this evil deed we're not going to do this sin because you're saying to do so now this next verse highlight it because this is kind of going to be the point of where we're going to discuss tonight and the midwife said unto pharaoh verse 19 because the hebrew women are not as the egyptian women for they are lively this is why we did it these these women are forking babies out so quick and they're delivered then they're delivered ere the midwives come in unto them they're having babies before we even get there that's what's happening here um, that we don't know why this is going on. They're, they're naturally baby shooters, man. And that's why we can't get, and that's why we can't fix this problem. And that's why we can't do what you're asking us to do. So now, what do you guys see happening here by their answer to the king of Egypt? See, I remember when I was reading this to my kids a long time ago, they basically said, they caught it right away. They said, so they lied. I said, yeah, they lied. <laughs> That's right. They lied to the king. They lied to the king. So, well, then is it, is it okay to lie? <laughs> is it, is it, last time I checked, the Bible said, thou shalt not lie. Last time I checked, we got to be submissive to our authorities. No matter what. I mean, that's kind of what I read. But here you got a couple of women here who uh, aren't being submissive to their authority. And also they're not telling the truth. You know, but there's a key word here. And this is something that we, this is a, an opportunity for us to really grab this. Because you know what? Um, this type of thinking about uh, how are we to be as believers when it comes to uh, I guess, little white lies or little things that can seem to be against God's will, but yet are they permissible or not? When we're on that line of deciding, you know, I wonder if I do this. I know, uh, I know the word says to do this, but, you know, I'm going to kind of go ahead and do this. And it may not be exactly what the word's wanting me to do. Is, you know, is that bad? Is that, is that wrong of me to do? You know, is, is it permissible? Is it permissible what I do when the Bible doesn't exactly say this is sinful or not? Is it permissible for me to do if, you know, uh, hey, so, you know, I drink a little bit, man, what? You know, the Bible says I don't have to get drunk. I, I'm not getting drunk. I get a good buzz on, but I don't get drunk. What's wrong with that? Hey, you know, I'm going to even get a little bit more real with you guys. We're all men. Hey, what about, uh, what about porn, man? My wife says I can look at it. You know, it's cool. She's all right with it. When, you know, what's wrong with that? As long as I'm not stepping over like these, you know, my wife. I remember I heard a message a long time ago in this room by Pancho Juarez. And he was talking about marriage. And I'll never forget it, obviously. You'll see why. He's like, yeah, you know, when you're married, you guys can do whatever you want. 
You can swing from the chandeliers naked and do whatever you guys want to do as husbands and wife. And I remember going, what? Did that brother just say that? And I was thinking like, there we go. <laughs> Let's do it, man. And you got no boundaries here because we're married. And, we can, and the marriage bed is undefiled according to the scripture. These, these areas where we have to question, Lord, is this wrong? But I don't know if it is or not, because the Bible doesn't exactly say it, if it is or not. There's a lot of those areas in our lives today. They're everywhere, man. And so you'll have some Christians making decisions based off of their own conviction. Hey, well, I do this because, hey, it's not wrong. And I'm not stumbling anybody. I do it in the privacy of my own home or whatever. I've heard that answer many times. Yeah, we do what we do in the privacy of our own home. You know, I'm not stumbling no one. And these questions, most of the time, guys, are pretty legit. You know, Christians ask legit questions, man. The Bible doesn't quite say what I should do on this. And I'm feeling like sometimes I should do this because I'm being told to do this. Or the influence of the world is doing this, so why can't I do that? The thing that, that we see here, though, this is the, something we really have to look at. The starting point for these women, their decision... The basis of their decision, the root of their decision was founded in what? The fear of the Lord. It was founded in the fear of God. You see, they didn't contemplate analytically based upon their own medical decisions. They weren't sitting there going, oh, man, well, we're going to look bad amongst our people if we do this. They weren't sitting there analyzing the situation based upon what they can do in their own self. They started off at one spot, one point, and that was, we fear the Lord. That word fear there, we know, means to reverence God. We, we revere the Lord. You know, we have to ask ourselves the next time we're in a situation where we're not really sure what God would want us to do, we have to ask ourselves the question, based upon if you fear the Lord. You see, if the Lord is with me right now, watching what I'm watching, what's he going to say? I don't care what anybody tells me I can do. If the Lord is with me and I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing and he's standing among me and, I, and, he's, and I'm seeking his blessing and that which what I'm doing right now, would I continue to do what I'm doing? If you had to ask yourself, you know, I really feel this area of my life is kind of vague. I'm not really sure. Well, ask yourself this. Make that decision based off of your interpretation of fearing God, of who he is at that moment in your life. You know, we hear that all the time. God is with you. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. But do we feel that all the time? Do we always feel like he's with us in every decision and everything we do and everywhere we look? But the reality of that is, guys, is the Lord is with us everywhere we are. And everything we do and everywhere we look, he's with us. And if we were to ask ourselves, man, I'm going to do this. But I have to think, putting God in perspective first what would he say? What would he do? Would he be blessed by what I'm doing? Would God be pleased by what I'm doing? Would he, would he say what I'm doing is honorable? And you know, here's the thing, though, is like we don't always hear God say, add a boy. You know what I mean? Like if you do something and you make a decision, whether you might be saying, you know, I'm doing this based off the fear of God. Okay, you got, you got, you got past that. You got past you because and what I mean by that is when we make decisions, we'll, we'll do it weird, man. I, I'm going to do this, you know, because I, it just makes me feel better. Or I'm going to do this because nobody's watching. I'm gonna do, or I'm going to do this because I know I'll be forgiven. <laughs> that's, that's even a, another one. Put all that aside for a minute. If you make the decision because you fear the Lord and you know he's with you and you know he's among you, the next thing after you make these types of decisions is what? I wonder if the Lord was okay with it. How do I know? How do I know if God was okay with the decision I just made? Well, let's, know, let's look at it. Verse 20. Therefore, because they did this decision, they lied to the king based off the fear of the Lord. Therefore, God dwelt, dealt well with the midwives. And he multiplied, and, he, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. Okay, and it came to pass because why? The midwives feared God, that he made them houses. So the one thing that I've, I've really struggled with in my Christian walk for, for, for a long time 
But I think, I think I'm beginning to learn a little bit, uh, trying to learn in my lessons well. The one thing we can look for if we know that God has gone before our decision-making and that our decision-making was right is we'll see the fruit of the ministry. We'll see the fruit of the Spirit. We'll see the fruit of God's hand in our lives. We'll see the fruit and the decision that we made. We'll see God behind it. Here was simple. Because they made the decision to not tell the king of Egypt the truth because they feared the Lord. It says that God dealt well with them. That God blessed them. That God went besides them. He went in front of them. And then he, and he went behind them. And, and their life began to show that God was going before their decision making. You know, the fruit grows on a tree very obviously, you know. Uh, I don't remember an apple tree that I called an apple tree that had no apples on it. You know, I, I don't remember seeing something that we have to really try to contemplate. Is that fruit or not? What is that little thing coming out of that tree? Well, no. You know what it is because it's growing to be that which it's supposed to. It's the same of our lives. It's the same truth of the Christian walk today. You will know by your fruit that God is going before you. You'll see them come right off you. You don't, you don't, you know... The last time I checked, it doesn't take a, a scientist to know that the apple's growing from a tree or that's, that there's grapes growing or whatever that is. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. It takes a natural man like you and I to know that something is fruitful. Well, it's the same way with our Christian walk, and that's why I love that Jesus gives so many of those examples with fruit because it's the same way with our lives. We will see the fruit coming out of our lives by the decisions that we make. By the things that we do. And you know what? To the other side of that, you'll see those fleshly decisions too. <laughs> you'll see those decisions that are made in, in self-power, in the flesh. And the Bible tells us what the fruit of the flesh looks like. And one of them is very selfish. It's, it's, it's the opposite of good, okay? <laughs> the things that come out of our lives that, that hurt someone, that bring confusion. That's another one. You know, are you one of those that is just producing forth fruit that's just bringing confusion to everyone around you? Every time you go and minister the gospel to them, they walk away going, what did that dude just say to me? My gosh, I feel horrible, but I feel good. But then I feel horrible. Then I'm confused. I don't even know what he's talking about. I don't even, you know, what do I do now? And, and, and anytime you're, you're trying to encourage someone and you go to encourage them and they just walk away going, man, well, you too, man. Whatever with you. And you can't even seem to encourage. You know, we got to think about the things we're saying, the things we're doing. Guys, by the fruit of what's happening around you is, is sort of kind of a, 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 a blueprint of what God's doing in your life. And now I'm not talking about like, I'm not even trying to preach that whole successful thing. Okay, I'm not saying, yeah, I got a huge house, man. So that means God's really working in my life. No, I'm not talking about that. We're not looking at that kind of stuff. I'm talking about that. That, that body ministry spirit fruit, the fruits of the spirit, joy, love, peace, the things that the Bible says, which is our fruit. You know, because uh, you could have peace in the middle of a storm, right? Because storms, they, they're, they're on everybody. Storms come and they go. Life and the trials happen to every one of us. It doesn't mean you're trialless, okay? Or, 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 or you're not, you're not going to, just because you're making decisions based off of what you might feel is righteousness and God's going before you, doesn't mean you're going to live a perfect, holy life as far as not, not any trouble coming your way. No, that's not true. But we will see ourselves producing forth peace in a trial. But do we go through trial and freaking out all over the place? And, and, we're, and we're just can't get a hold of ourselves? I love that one of the fruits of the Spirit is, is long-suffering, to be, to be patient, to be patient. That's not something we, we can create. Try being patient in a, in a trial or when something's going on. Trusting in the Lord. And then we see the fruits of the flesh, you know? Just think of everything opposite, angry. Do you find yourself just becoming frustrated, losing control of yourself? Because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. That's heavy. That's not, stuff that, that's not stuff that we can make up. We can't strive to become that way. Those are things that God does in your life, in and through you, based upon the decisions you're making because you fear and know who the Lord is in your life. You know who he is. You know what he's called you to do. You know that his presence is with you. 
You're trusting in him. Like the Bible says, he will find himself in perfect peace whose mind has stayed upon him who trusts in him. And so when we're trusting in the Lord, we're finding ourselves producing that fruit that only the Bible and only the Lord can do. I was asking Pastor Jeff the other day, we were talking about something, and I was asking him about decisions he's made in his life. And, and I, I think I said something like, so man, did you have like a, I was talking about somebody, and I'm like, did you have like a vision or something, man? Or, or did you seem like in a dream? I wanted to hear it real heavy, you know? I wanted him to tell me something really supernatural. And, and I wanted to hear him say, yeah, I saw it in a dream, man. And I, was, I would have been like, yeah, man, that's God right there, man. But it didn't happen that way. I, he said, no, I just made this one decision. And, you know, things got real horrible afterwards, and I knew it wasn't the Lord. I go, what? Like, I thought to myself, I guess so, man. Like, we, we will know by the fruit, by what takes place, you know, in our lives, how we make decisions. But fearing the Lord, the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It also says in Proverbs 9.10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. See, guys, fearing the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Fearing the Lord. How many of us fear God today? You know, it's, you can look around our culture today, and it's very obvious that people don't fear God anymore. But you know what? I, 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 I give my heart to those people because they don't fear God. It's because they don't know him. You know what I mean? If you knew God, you would fear God <laughs> if you knew him, <laughs> if you knew who he was, if you experienced the Lord, if you've received him in your heart and you've, and you've got to walk a walk with a, a just God, a loving God, one that deals wisely with his children. It's like they say, um, we need to thank God that he disciplines you because God chastens those he loves, the Bible tells us. <laughs> so, so, so imagine if you were just a, a bratty old kid never getting disciplined your whole life. How would you turn out to be? So you see, God disciplines or chastens those he loves. That's the kind of God we have. And so you start to learn throughout your walk with God. You know, God is just, he's fair, but he's loving and he's powerful. And he's supernatural, too, at the same time. And he's natural at the same time. And you start to get this well-rounded picture of who God is. And, you know, through your life as you're walking with him, going through the ups and downs of life, you start to develop a fear of who he is. But a good a reverence fear to a king, to someone that you, somebody that you more than just respect, you love, you offer your service to him, you offer your life to the king. Because, you know, by his decision-making, Things are going to be okay. Because why? He's a good shepherd. That's why. Because our king and our God is a shepherd at the same time. Who leaves you as a person not in want, the Bible tells us. We know the Psalms. He leads us next to still waters. You know, he, he, he protects us with his rod and his staff. And so God becomes the shepherd king to us all. And that person, that God, is the one we fear. And we fear because we don't want to do something out of flesh, we don't want to, we don't want to, and, and to some degree, offend the Lord. And so we say, Lord, go before my decisions that I'm making, that I won't step outside of the will you have for my life. And we say, Lord, help me to make the right thing because I don't want to put myself in a position that I'm feeling like I'm just running amok in my flesh before you, Lord. This is the God that we fear today. This is the God that we know and love. And today, unfortunately... Um, it's been a, 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 a concept that's been sort of watered in the church today because we want to preach and talk about a loving God only. Oh, he's so loving, because he is, by the way. But, oh, you know, don't, don't get weird about having to fear God and, and living righteously and stuff. You know, he knows you're a failure, so just keep being your failure self you are and keep sinning. It's okay. Uh, he just loves you, that's all. Jesus loves you, man. And so don't let nobody tell you you got to fear God because, you know, he doesn't care about, he just wants to love you, that's it. And, and that, that, that concept has gotten real muddied today to the point where you get a lot of preachers who don't even talk about sin. They don't want to go there. Why talk about sin, man? You're, you're a downer. You're going to bring the church down. You're going to get everybody else sad. They're going to walk out all bummed out. 
because you're talking about sin, you know. We don't do that here. Well, I talk about sin because Jesus talked about sin. That's why, not because I want to. In fact, I talk about sin because it's sin that brings somebody to Jesus. That's why. Because it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And repentance happens because we realize that we're sinners (laughs) before a holy God. So we really need to turn our attention these days as believers to, Lord, teach us how to teach us what that fear is. And when you say that prayer, don't think it's going to come upon you like a dove. Oh, I got the fear of God now. I wish it happened that way. It more than likely is going to come in the shape of a trial (laughs) or something that's going to devastate your life because it's going to make you turn your eyes towards the Lord and never want to take them off of him. And so we see God now saying, these women, yeah, they said, they, 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 didn't, they told the Pharaoh whatever they wanted to tell him. But you see, that wasn't important in God's eyes because what was important was their decision that they made. The premise, the pulse, the heartbeat of it was the fear of God. So be comforted next time you're in a place where you've got to make a decision. And you're not really sure what God would want you to do. You feel like, man, I'm not really sure how to tell you. Stop right there for a moment and tell yourself, okay, if I make this decision based off of the fear of the Lord, then, hey, what can go, go wrong? <laughs> you know, if I'm going to go ahead and go forward with this, but with this respect and this idea that God is, is with me, he's my shepherd, he has instructions for me through the word, and that's what I'm going to make this decision off of. And we will see the confirmation like these women have seen. Because God confirms that. That's, thank God for that. Thank God he can, he's a confirming God. He wants us to know that we made the right decision because that's how we learn. That's how we learn. He wants us to know. Yes, I took a step of faith, Lord, and I made a mistake. Well, he wants you to know that because he wants you to learn. Or, yes, I took a step of faith, Lord, and he blesses it, and he wants you to know that he blessed it because he wants you to see that you heard from the Spirit of God, and that way you can tell someone else, yes, pray, fast over these things. You'll see the Lord. He'll intervene. He's a God that wants us to learn to fear him. He won't force it on you because a God or a king that forces fear upon his people, that's a dictator. That's evil. That's evil. And you know who wants to do that is Satan. And so we have to spend ourselves learning the voice of God and the voice of Satan. Because Satan's going to try to appear as God and condemn you. God's spirit's going to come alongside you and convict you. (laughs) You see, there's a difference. There's a difference between being condemned and convicted. When you're convicted, the sorrow comes out of your heart. What have I done, man? When you're condemned, you're like, dang it, what did I do, man? I just screwed everything up, man. God, watch, I got to go cut myself a few times and find yourself and repented. I'm going to go and read my Bible six times tonight, Lord, because I'm, I'm, I'm condemned right now by the enemy. He's lying to you. A God and a king, or a false God and a false king, is going to demand and, and, and yell and require but a God that loves and he wants to bring about fear through conviction, it's going to be a, one that leads to, to, to repentance, leads to sorrow, leads to a genuine heartfelt decision, you know, a genuine heartfelt, uh, man, Lord, I, I've, Lord, forgive me because I've sinned. But see, today the voice of the enemy is even in so many voices around us. It's our, it's our nation today. It's TV all day long, man. It's all these things that we have around us that you feel shouting at the Christian, condemning you for, for what you're thinking and for what you're doing. And, you know, one sign, one fruit that I've learned in my life when I feel like I'm listening to the condemnation of the enemy and I think it's God, one of those fruits I find me doing is striving. Because when you're condemned and you think God, it's God but it's not, but when you think it's him, then you feel like you got to strive. You feel like you got to do something to make up for it. Like, oh, Lord, what did I do? I messed up so badly. I better go do something now to make you happy again. Well, when did, where's that in the Bible? Where, where does God say, you, you better get busy because I'm going to get madder if you don't? Where do we see that? 
That's a lie from the enemy. Because our God says, I'm convicting you. What you did was, uh, repent. Because when you repent, then you receive mercy. And when you receive mercy, you can rest. Not strive. You can rest. And I've fought for so long. Me personally. I've strived for so long. And I've thought to work my way to please God because I am good for nothing and lousy, okay? And I remember the night the Lord told me, you don't know what rest is. You don't know how to rest in me because you're not receiving my mercy and grace in all of your situations. He showed me that I only received his mercy and grace to get me into heaven. Lord, forgive me my sins. Cool, I'm going to heaven now. Awesome. But the rest of my life has been up to me to do. And that's when the Lord showed me, no, no, no. That mercy and grace that I gave you that's going to get you into heaven, that's the mercy and grace that I'm going to get you through every one of your situations too. And so every day you might find yourself in rest. Yeah, you can rest in a storm, didn't Jesus? He was on a pillow down there in the boat, right in the middle of a storm. They're freaking everybody out. I don't even know how he was sleeping. It was, and he's sleeping during a storm. Not to, not to show off. Not to be like, look at me, man. I'm Christ. I sleep in storms. Look at you guys. You're all messed up. That's not why he did that. He did that to show them, look, it's possible. With me, you can sleep in a storm. You can rest in a storm. You can. With my mercy and grace, with me, my presence in your life, you can find rest, even in a storm. Don't strive to maintain. Don't strive your walk with God, man. It's so exhausting. It really is. And I love that, too, because, listen, God loves us enough to let you exhaust yourself. He'll let you go like a father does to his kids. You know, I've done it, too, with mine. You let your kids, you let them go. Go ahead. Okay, you think you know it all? Go ahead. You tell them, go ahead, know it all. And then they're all exhausted and they're done. They're tired, and then you come alongside them. You say, see, well, this is why I was trying to tell you. This is what you're supposed to do. Same thing the Lord does us. He loves us. We're, we're sons of God, the Bible says. He will exhaust you until there's no more human help, and the only other thing you have left over is him. Verse 22, let's finish up here. And now Pharaoh, after dealing with all this, charged all his people, saying, every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So, remember this. Remember this. <laughs> this is something for me, too. Every time the Lord's doing a work in our lives, every time we're moving forward, every time he's confirming things, and yes, we're, let's say, yes, we're producing the fruit of the Spirit, and God wants us to, to see that. Remember this. Satan still hates you. He ain't done. He will still come right back around at you, even with the same tactics. See here, Pharaoh's saying, oh, okay, all right, you think you guys got one up on me? Well, now I'm going to tell my people to kill all the babies. Interesting, history really doesn't account this in Egyptian history. Uh, biblical history, you might see some mention of, of this particular scripture, verse 22. But commentators and a lot of researchers really never found exactly how many babies were thrown in the river after. We don't know. We don't know how many people actually listened to Pharaoh and said, oh, okay, if I'm just a neighbor, I'll go throw that baby in the river. It would take a lot for a person to do that. We do know this much, though, that, that this threat here continued for a while because that's where we get Moses being let down in the river and all that because they were still cautiously aware that this was an instruction that Pharaoh gave out. So we do know that this last little edict that he put out, it was still lasting for quite some time. So more than likely, there probably was some babies that were thrown into the river after this. You know, the, the, the midwives only were able to do for the time that they did. And they were only to respond at the way that they did while they had the control over it. But then, you know, it went into Pharaoh's hands again, and he gave back this edict to all the people. The enemy doesn't, doesn't stop. But we can now get used to his tactics because they don't change. See, Satan's not God. Don't, don't think he is. He's not Jesus' brother or whatever, like some people say. He doesn't have the power of Christ. So his tactics are the same. 
He only knows how to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said he only knows how to what, Jesus said? How to lie. He's the father of lies. So when we're being hard-pressed, guys, and when we're in this walk together, and let's say you are a brother that's just living the Christian life, doing as much as you can do to understand from God, God's producing fruit in your life, and you're still being attacked. Well, just know this. Recognize the attacks of the enemy. And, and we don't recognize them because all of a sudden you become a ninja where now you never get attacked by the enemy ever again. You recognize them because now you know that it's the enemy. And you, and you can tell and you say, oh, that's just Satan. He's trying to, now he's just trying to condemn me. I've been there, done that. And you still feel it. Don't get me wrong. We'll still feel it because we're flesh and our tenth of a body is lousy. And thank God it's going to be gone one day. We'll still feel it. But we can recognize it. And that's where, that's where Jesus doesn't become your healer. He becomes your teacher. He doesn't perform the miracle, but he teaches you through it. And because he does all these different things. The Lord wants to be involved in our lives on so many levels. And so let him teach you. And if you find yourself with this reoccurring attack from the enemy, let's say you're one of those guys that just, it's the same warfare every time. Well, because the Lord's still showing, he wants you to learn that it's Satan and that it's the enemy just messing with your head, messing with your life, and he's using the same thing to do it. So we got to rebuke that in Jesus' name, man, and we got to, and we got to fail. Sometimes you got to fail, but you fail to learn. You don't fail to, again, you don't fail and get condemned to stop. You fail to say, Lord, forgive me. Now I need that mercy and I need that grace, and we keep going. Because I believe if God was to deliver me from my thing that I dealt with for so many years now, I would have never, if, the, if day one, I've told myself this, if God performed a miracle in my life and set me free from what I deal with and what I go through, then I wouldn't have learned so much. I wouldn't have learned what I know today. And I wouldn't have recognized the voice of Satan like I know it today. And so I find myself these days thanking God for my trial and for the things that I go through. Because I say, man, that's kind of cool. Like, it's not, it wasn't cool, all right, for many times. But that's kind of cool that I'm learning now. And I think that la that's going to last longer for me. And at the same time, for those of us who are going through things, and God may not be immediately taking it away at that moment, well, know that he's teaching you. And the amazing part about it is you're going to be able to help someone else along their path with God and teach them and let them know, hey, this is the enemy. He's, do you feel condemned right now or do you feel convicted? Well, I feel kind of like I'm being, you know, well, that's condemnation. That's the enemy. You know, you'll be able to lift someone up and help them out. And so here we are, this, this rest of this chapter, this, what the midwives did, what the Egypt, the Pharaoh did, what God did. And it's just, just a little picture of life in itself, isn't it? It's a little picture of what the journey that we're on with God is. All right here in these little verses. It's just a, it's a quick snapshot of what we're going to see take place now for the rest of this book. I love the book of Exodus. It discusses God's power and his, his miracle working hand and everything of, of God's delivering power. And at the same time, it shows, though, the enemy. All in the middle of that. All in the middle of salvation, deliverance. You're going to see the enemy follow all the way through. And so here we are, though, starting off with God, taking a step in to show them and us as readers, he's God, fear the Lord, he can do what he wants, and yes, we're stuck with an enemy too. Fear the Lord, man. It's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for this time together, Lord, as we just are getting into this book studying it, Lord, as we want to seek for what you have to say to us, because you are a loving God. You're a loving Father. You're a good shepherd. So, Lord, we just pray for the rest of this night, and, and even after we leave tonight, Lord, as we know, the enemy just seems to always keep, he, get, he gets going right away. And uh, so, Lord, we just, we see him, we recognize that he's very much alive in this world today, but we also, more importantly, recognize your presence and how you're alive. And you're not only alive, you're victorious over him. So let this be something written on our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.